Ryan, what's on your radar this morning? So the news about the labor market has me thinking about one of the classic viral videos of a previous internet era. In the middle of September in 2011, as Barack Obama and a Republican Congress were debating just how much spending should be slashed so we could, quote, tighten our belts, a small group of people, and then a much larger group of people, took over Zuccotti Park in New York City, launching Occupy Wall Street. A few weeks later, a kid named Joey showed up at his job in a hotel in Providence to send a message. And so that his bosses were able to hear it loud and clear, he brought his entire band with him. My favorite part is the bit at the end of this video here where somebody changes to zero the number of days since there'd been a lost time accident. Here's Joey, 10 years ago to the day. Guys, what is this? Guys, all of you out right now. Jared, I'm here to tell you that I'm quitting. So I'm thinking about Joey not because it's the 10-year mark of that hilarious stunt, but because this month, more than 4 million workers across the country became Joey's. The month that Joey quit his job, just 1.5% of workers did the same. That quit rate is what bosses call churn, and some amount of quitting and switching jobs is normal, even in the midst of the Great Recession. But in August, the number was nearly double that with almost 3% of workers, 4.3 million of them, leaving their jobs. Restaurants, bars, and hotels have always seen more turnover than in other jobs, hovering normally at around 4%. In August, the numbers were literally off the charts at 6.8%. That means roughly one out of every 15 workers in restaurants, bars, and hotels quit in August. The next highest turnover came in retail, which also isn't surprising, but the numbers were up everywhere. Healthcare, manufacturing, white collar jobs, you name it. At the beginning of the pandemic, a million workers were being laid off every single day. And we haven't yet gotten to the unemployment rate that we had in March 2020. In September, the Bureau of Labor Statistics found 7.7 .7 million people unemployed. But there's another 6 million that they define as people who want a job but don't count as part of the labor force because they haven't looked for a job in the last four weeks. On top of that, there was another 1.7 million they call marginally attached to the labor force. Having 4.3 million people quit in August threatens to amplify a vicious cycle that's already punishing workers on the job. When businesses are short-staffed, that means the workers who are still there have to pick up the slack. It also means customers are seeing worse service, which takes customer behavior from its customary level of absolutely hellish and ramps it up to worst people on earth status. Add into the mix that people are pissed off because of the pandemic and pissed off they're being asked to wear a mask and pissed off if they see a sign they, that they should wear a mask if they're not vaccinated because, hey, this is a free country and it's their God-given right to whip out an iPhone in the and in the name of freedom, film and berate the worker who's not being paid enough to put up with this. So back before I got into journalism and found something I actually like doing, I was fired from more or less every job I'd ever had. In fact, one restaurant at Great Oak Marina on the Eastern Shore of Maryland fired me two years in a row. Now, oftentimes, the line between whether I was fired or simply quit was a thin one. And at the root of it was a structural problem that our economy and our society has made very little progress in grappling with. And that's the inescapable fact that work sucks. For a long time, you could say that the only thing that sucked more than working was not working. Now. For many people, that's not even true anymore. To get workers to come back to work, bosses are going to have to not just pay people what they're worth, they're going to have to treat people like they're worth something. Workers last year were thrown to the wolves by the millions at the start of the pandemic, yet bosses are now stunned that they're not eager to crawl back. 
One worker interviewed by the Washington Post said she quit her job in August after she learned the company planned to outsource a ton of its jobs. Jennifer Booth said she was putting in 90 hour weeks during the pandemic and said, quote, to be working as much as humanly possible for all of 2020 and then get told we don't matter. It felt like crap. Yesterday, I talked here about John Deere workers who rejected the company's contract offer and are potentially striking at midnight tonight. Labor, labor journalist Jonah Furman reported yesterday that management is threatening to move the plant out of Waterloo, Iowa, if they strike. That is the opposite of treating workers with any dignity. So unless management starts to get the message, they might just want to get used to this song. Joey, by the way, had spent more than three years at that hotel, and his quitting was part of a union drive that was later successful. While he worked there, he met a woman named Victoria Ruiz. They put a band together, and, that, and they're now called Downtown Boys, and they're going strong. And Joey is a labor historian at the University of Rhode Island. So I guess the moral of the story is, quit. I mean, especially in this uh, pandemic context, and I'm curious for your take on this, where people have been made at least slightly more comfortable with stimulus checks. And some people have been able to save those or to replenish their savings, have been able to at least, that's, that's cushioned some of the blow mm -hmm. from the mass layoffs that you mentioned here earlier in the pandemic. And what I'm really curious about also is how businesses are going to respond to this, because your John Deere radar makes a such an important point that if, if businesses are responding to the demands of workers by outsourcing more jobs mm -hmm. and moving out of Waterloo, Iowa, they're not really getting the message and the sort of populist moment, if ever there were a time for them to get the message and to adapt, it would be when you have this kind of cultural political context that is explaining why it's important and actually the hard numbers <laughs> that is right. it's telling them, like, you need workers what's the patriotic thing to do? What is the right thing to do? What is the moral thing to do? What is the moral and the decent thing to do for your workers? Is it to, to leave the country? Right, and John Deere's staring at $6 billion in profit this year. Yeah. And is staring at the passage of a House infrastructure bill yes. that is, that is going to shovel another you know, hundreds of billions of dollars toward the types of projects that boost their bottom line. Secondly, what leverage do they have at this moment? So the, the bosses are going to tell the workers, oh, yeah, well, if you don't agree to our demands, we're going to go over to China. We're going to make our products there. Mm -hmm. We're going to put them in big shipping containers, and we're going to ship them over here. And oh, wait a minute. We're going to, and then they'll sit there in yep. the ocean for weeks and weeks and weeks while our competitors who made them here are able to just keep them moving. And so you know, there, there's a disconnect. Mm -hmm. between the way that the, the, the geopolitical boss set is, is watching the supply chains fall apart yep. and not thinking, oh, well, maybe we should just pay these folks a little bit more in, in Waterloo, Iowa, and, and, yeah. and treat them with, with the dignity that they're asking. Because it's, it's, not, not really it's not really about wages, interestingly, in that fight. It's about the John Deere's demand to create a three-tier system for different workers to divide workers around you know who gets better pensions and who gets better uh, you know who gets better benefits when the current workers are you know I think you know with 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 some real uh, courage and and humility are fighting for future workers mm -hmm. saying no yes we, we want benefits but we want them to apply to people you know who come behind us too they're showing a lot more faith in the future and in this country than their bosses are. You know, it's also interesting because wages, like the Amazon, like Bessemer, take Bessemer, that was not really about wages either. Um, and wages are only one part of this really complicated puzzle. And watching the supply chains is, again, like very instructive because there is a disconnect there. And that's another like really instructive glimpse at how COVID has shaken things up to the point of almost being clarifying. And so from the outside, it is clarifying. And it's like, all you have to do 
is treat these workers a little bit better at this plant in the Midwest. Um, but for them, it's they're sort of still entrenched in a, a mentality that I don't think really even serves their own purposes anymore. Um, and it, that's going to be, that's what COVID is ultimately testing, is will the, the corporations respond to obvious sort of challenges Will they rise to those challenges and even give market-driven better treatment, market-driven adjustments? Even Will they even make those? Um, and that's the question I think remains outstanding. Right. No, and we'll, we'll see. And it's a question we could put to Joey. I reached out to him last night, found him. Uh, he's, he said he's happy to come on the show. He's, so that, uh, That's great. Yeah. Joe, things have gone well for Joey. It sounds like it. Years. Joey was able to, to uh, make the labor market work for him. Yeah. Um, and I, I imagine a whole lot of people are not, haven't been as lucky. Um, but it is a, it's a testament to, you know, if, if, you, if you look for something interesting, you just might be able to find it. Indeed. <laughs> we'll find out tomorrow. Uh, Team Rising joins us next. We'll have more right after this.